Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, first, a brief message in French. Uh, ceux qui voudraient écouter uh, le débat uh, en français doivent appuyer sur le bouton interprétation uh, où, il, uh, uh, où il y a une uh, traduction, une traduction, une version en français en direct. Um, but I will continue in English which is probably the best for everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you today to a debate on uh, Haiti, which, as you know, has experienced some months of tremendously <coughs> serious turmoil on various different uh, planes. My name is Ivan Briscoe. I'm the Programme Director for Latin America and the Caribbean of the International Crisis Group. And uh, we have recently published uh, a short piece on Haiti, and we remain deeply worried by the events in that country. Across Latin America we have seen, and the Caribbean, we have seen some serious uh, turmoil and turbulence, especially during the pandemic, uh, with political and social crises in a number of countries. But none of them are quite as bad and quite as distressing as what has occurred in recent months in Haiti. Um, it's not just the scale of the threats which uh, Haiti and the Haitian people have faced, which obviously include the assassination of the President Moise in July, earthquake and tropical storms in August, uh, an ongoing, very serious crime wave, which culminated over the weekend, as many of you will know, with the kidnapping of 17 Canadian and US uh, missionaries, uh, five of them children, but it's the fact that all of these uh, different uh, events and trends and, and problems seem to be worsening at the same time. Uh, Any one on its own would be an immense challenge for a nation to face. All of them together would seem to represent uh, a, an almost impossible challenge, um, which Haiti finds itself before. Uh, there is a great veil of uncertainty over the future of the country in a number of ways. And I very much hope that our illustrious guest today will help us to understand a little bit better uh, wh why and how uh, Haiti, uh, with the support from abroad, may be able to pull itself out of the situation it finds itself in. We don't quite know what the political formation of the next government or the, or the evolution of the current interim government will be like. We don't know what the results, the final results, the investigation into uh, Moise's assassination will be. We don't know the scale, the dimensions of international support uh, for the country. And we certainly don't know what will happen with the uh, deportations of Haitians to Haiti and how that might affect the circumstances. And we certainly don't fully understand, or uh, we don't, uh, but uh, some of our panelists might, uh, what will be happening in the, in the gangs and the criminal organizations operating in the country. Uh, we're honoured to have guests from Haiti uh, and working in the United States, but uh, with a long time interest in the country on the panel today. Some of the most respected voices and analysts on Haiti uh, um, are, are present and we look forward to uh, the conversation uh, in the hope that we might have some better understanding of how to plot a world out of the current situation. On that note, I'm handing over to my deputy director, who will be moderating the conversation today, uh, Renata Segura. Renata, thank you. Thanks, Ivan, very much. And thank you and welcome uh, everybody to, to today's very important conversation on the Haitian crisis. Um, just to give you a little bit of a sense of how the day is go the, the event is going to go, we have um, around an hour and a half for a conversation. Our panelists are going to present each for eight to 10 minutes, and then hopefully we'll have at least half an hour for question and answers. If you're in, joining us by Zoom, you will see a Q&A window in the bottom of the screen, and you can type your questions there. You can type them as the presenters are speaking or wait at the end, and I will be keeping an eye on that and, and reverting them to the panel um, at the end of the formal presentations. So before I turn to, to our my very uh, distinguished guests today, um, let me just briefly present them 
for the audience. Um, I'm going to present them in the order in which they will be uh, speaking. Uh, first will come Leslie Voltaire, who is a member of the coordination of the monitoring office of the Montana political agreement between civil society and political actors. He's an architect and urban planner by trainer, and he has had many positions in Haiti, including Minister of Education and Sports, Chief of Staff to President Aristide, Advisor to President Reval, Minister for the Haitians Living Abroad and Special Envoy to the United Nations in 2009. Uh, Leslie was a candidate for the presidency in 2010 and he's been, he has been incredibly active during the recent crisis. We're very grateful for his participation today. We also have uh, William O'Neill, who goes uh, normally by Bill, who's a lawyer specializing in humanitarian human rights and refugee law. Bill has worked on Haiti for many decades where he laid uh, the legal department of the UN OAS mission. He has also worked with the UN in Kosovo and Rwanda. He has worked on judicial, police, and prison reform in Burundi, Liberia, Sierra Leone, South Sudan, Timor-Leste, Tunisia, Nepal, and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, I had the pleasure to work with Bill at the Conflict Correction and Peace Forum at the Social Research Council, and Bill has been very generously advising ICG on our work on Haiti in the recent months. We then have Monique Kleskas, who is a member of the Civil Society Commission to find a Haitian solution to the crisis, and also a member of the Haiti think tank. Monique has worked for over 25 years on issues such as high level political dialogue, human rights, youth and women programming, development, and crisis communication and writing. She was the representative of the United Nations Population Fund in Niger in 2012. She's a well-recognized analyst and her writing has appeared in major Haitian and international newspapers. Thank you, Monique, for joining us today. We then have Jacqueline Charles, who is the correspondent of the Miami Herald with responsibility for Haiti and the English speaking Caribbean. Jacqueline is a Pulitzer Prize finalist and Emmy Award winning journalist who has written extensively about US immigration issues and the impact on the Haitian community. Her most recent project, Cancer in Haiti, garnered several awards, including the prestigious 2019 AACR June L. Beidler Prize for Cancer Journalism. Jacqueline, thank you so much for making time on your busy schedule to join us. And last but not least, we have Ashish Perhan, uh, my colleague um, at International Crisis Group, where he is the senior UN analyst. Um, Ashish joined uh, ICG, uh, the New York team, in September of 2020. 15, and together with our chief of policy, he represents the organization at the United Nations. He is the responsible person for crisis group engagement with the UN Secretariat, Security Council members and other member states, and his work primarily focuses on Africa and the nation crisis. He had previously worked for ICG in the Asia program in his native Nepal, but has been following very closely the UN debate on Haiti, and uh, we think he has very important contributions to this conversation. So without further ado, let me turn to the panel. Leslie, you have 10 minutes. If you're approaching that mark, I'll start waving at you, please. Uh, you're muted, hey, uh, Leslie. Stefan, can you unmute? Okay, now. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Renata. And thank you for the invitation on that uh, such distinguished panel of ICG. Haiti's political crisis is an immigration crisis for the region and a governance one for the Haitians. It is structural and must be analyzed as a process of deconstruction of the Haitian neo-colonial state built by the US occupation. It was a repressive state to control the peasants to a gendarmerie overseeing the rural areas with the section chiefs and supported by the military district officer. The Duvalier added a militia of 300,000 Tonton Makut or boogeymen to that repressive apparatus. From 1804 to 1986, the majority of the population had been terrorized by dictators, autocrats, governing for a small educated black and mulatto elite who concentrated the economic power. At the turn of the 20th century, the Syro Lebanese arrived and gradually became part of that elite. During the US occupation, the US government and the investors did a 
special division of production. They created sugarcane plantations and mills in Cuba and the Dominican Republic and organized the migration of Haitian labor to these plantations. This is why we have half a million of Haitian descendants in Cuba and a million in the Dominican Republic. Between 62, 1962 and 1968, Francois Duvalier opened the gates of the first migration for Haitian intellectuals and technicians to Africa and Canada. When he died, the US supported his son Jean-Claude as the new president for life and promoted Haiti as the Taiwan of the Caribbean. Investments were made in the industrial park in Port-au-Prince, which attracted workers from the countryside. But Duvalier's son, Baby Doc, repressive policies could not contain the waves of protest and could not provide for the needs of the population. And around the 80s, a free press and several strikes and protest movement, followed by government repression, incited the peasants, the political activists, the middle class to emigrate to the Bahamas, Miami, New York, Montreal, the French overseas departments. And uh, uh, last but not least, the third wave uh, during those last 10 years went to Chile, Brazil, and again in the US and the DR. Approximately two to three million Haitians live abroad. Maybe half of them do so illegally. According to the World Bank, more than 64% of Haitians live in cities and more than 80% of all the Haitian university graduates intellectual, professional, artists live abroad. The absence of that middle class and the accelerated urbanization, meaning massive arrival of peasants to the unprepared city structure is a big obstacle to economic development and the practice of democracy. There is no buffer between the haves and the have nots. The newcomers have deforested their mountainous land and have sold it to come to the city. This quarter's land not suited for housing and created immense slums, call it ghettos by them, and uncontrollable by the small police force. Once organized into neighborhood watch groups, now they have become gang controlled territory for kidnappings, smuggling of arms, ammunition, and drugs. From 86 to 21, the repressive police and predator state have reached their expiration date. During that period, the donor country's strategy was to bypass the state and to finance PVOs and NGOs, depleting the government of its professional cadres and technicians. The weakening of the state public administration, the brain drain and some measures of structural adjustments ruined the agricultural sector even further and accelerated the urbanization process and the dependency on the US and the DR for migrations. In the 1990s, Jean-Bertrand Aristide election gave hope to the majority of the population that change had arrived, but his government was crushed seven months later by the military supported by the US government, which established a paramilitary gang called FRAP to repress the popular movement. Three years later, Aristide was reestablished in power. In 2004, the US intervened again ousting Aristide for seven years to South Africa. Meanwhile, the UN deployed a military force of deterrence in all the regions of Haiti to stabilize the country under the minister, President Preval and Martelly were able to complete their mandates. How did we get to the Jovenel murder? Blatant US interference into Haiti's 2010-2011 general elections is the major cause of the current political crisis. Totally unprepared and inexperienced individuals, Martelly and Lamotte with questionable morals and ethics were placed at the helms of Haiti to make up for the lack of experience and the absence of a legislative base, the new political leaders made various deals with legislative leaders. Corruption and the use of gangs to strengthen Martelly's as a ruling political party was brought back into the political arena and reached new summits. Legislative leaders brought their respective gangs on board and Martelly built his own power base of gangs. A serious rift developed between the PHTK party over the sharing of the Petro-Caribe funds 
and the succession of Martelly. When Martelly pulled Jovenel Moise out of political obscurity to make him his successor as president, tensions reached a climax. With the support of the majority of Haiti's businessmen, Jovenel Moise pulled the first round victory in 2016. He tried to assert himself as the man in charge, but ran into much resistance as the petrol funds quickly dried up and the program itself was terminated, new sources of income was to be identified. A power struggle began to control the energy sector, the oil import business, the ports and the borders, the customs. President Moise ran high budget deficits to cover his irrational public policies and finance some social program that helped enrich him and a few of his cronies. Since 2018, the majority of the population went in opposition to the Moïse government. Severe strikes paralyzed the cities and the countryside. Long nonviolent marches and protests always repressed by the police characterized the three final years of Moïse. The gangs were financed by the state to counter that growing opposition. The UN and the core group gave its support to the confederation of gangs called G9. The battle for Moïse succession caused a lot of rifts, rifts within the ruling group, and Moïse did not let anyone guess who would get his political blessing and support. Martelly is a contender, Lamotte is a contender, and rumors of a Martin Moïse candidacy surfaced from time to time. His political opponents criticized his total control and destructions of all the institutions symbolizing that left of Haiti's shaking democracy. With a totally collapsed economy, state, parliament suspended, a dysfunctional Supreme Court, president ruling by decree and coronavirus, President Moïse just decided to establish a national intelligence agency, essentially taking powers and legitimate authorities away from Haiti National Police and giving it illegitimate, illegitimate authorities for surveillance and arrest. During his final years in power, Jovenel Moïse attacked various sectors, the corrupt oligarchs, as he loved to call them, without naming anyone. At the same time, he made some bold moves towards setting up a strong personal economic base. His last move was to trip was the trip to Turkey and the signing of undisclosed agreements with that country. Since 2020, the political parties have been meeting to reach an agreement to replace Moïse on the 7th of February, 2021. At that time, a group of civil society initiated a citizen movement to put pressure for change and contacted the political parties and all the organized sectors of the population. After his brutal assassination, there was a void of legitimate power. The transition began on the day of the murder. First phase was Claude Joseph, the acting prime minister. A tweet of the United Nations Bureau dismissed him a week later. Second phase is Ariel Henry with the Moïse government. Third phase could be Ariel, Moï, uh, Ariel Henry with a coalition of parties or maybe another formula with a president and a national rescue government. Now, can the political elites agree on a plan to resolve the crisis? I think that economic, political, social, and intellectual elites are doomed to find a compromise between them to get the country out of the global crisis they are living. It is in this sense that we understand the approach of the Montana Agreement between civil society and the political and popular organizations. Unfortunately, the dominant actors in the international or at the local economic level for their own interest further continue to manipulate some local political and private sectors to stand up against this national compromise. But the crisis will not be resolved if we don't find a common interest, a common ground with the international community and mainly the US and the DR. In the first half of the 21st century, our common objective is to fix the Haitians in Haiti. This can necessitate a new deal or even a new Marshall Plan for Haiti, 
a plan that will mitigate the, climate, the climatic changes and promote near shoring manufacturing facilities, a plan that will include the best brands of the Haitian diaspora. It would improve the lives of many now fleeing by establishing security and functioning government institutions and could finally pave the way for the long-term political and social stability that has eluded the country for decades. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leslie, for that very comprehensive historical perspective on how we got today. And I think you have marked many of the issues that I think we'll be looking in a little bit more detail throughout the panel. Thank you so very much. Uh, let me turn now to Bill, who will speak a little bit more about the question of violence and in particular the justice and, and um, police reforms that are needed. Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. And um, thank you, Leslie, also for getting us off to such a good start with that overview. And I'm going to be picking up some of the themes you've just mentioned. Um, first, the three main ideas I want to get out there, and I want to get them out now in case I run out of time. So the first point is talking about the gangs and violence and insecurity. I see this issue really reflecting one of the points Leslie just made. It's a, it's a manifestation really of a struggle between those who want to build a new hate, Haitian state and those who want to preserve the old system that, that Leslie described that was built a long time ago. Um, and so this gang struggle, who they are, who's behind them and who's against them is, is really part of this struggle. What is the Haitian state going to be? The second point is that state institutions uh, that control, that should control violence, prevent it, punish it, uh, punish those responsible, and particularly the courts, police, and prisons, have been intentionally sabotaged, infiltrated, and prevented from fulfilling their basic goals and duties and obligations. Uh, and, that, and that's key. It, it relates to everything, but certainly to the violence and, and insecurity. And aligned with that is the state institutions that are supposed to provide social services, education, healthcare, clean water, are totally missing in action in precisely the places that Leslie just described, these huge urban areas, and let alone the countryside, which is always ignored. But now you have huge parts of Port-au-Prince that have no access to basic uh, social services. And then the third point is Haiti has been enduring for many years a climate of impunity. Impunity reigns and persists. And, and I would argue there is no way out of this current crisis unless the, the specter, the reality of, of impunity is addressed. And last, I'll come up, I hope I'd offer some ideas about the ways forward and out of this mess. So first, on the, back to the gangs and issue. Gangs and armed groups, as Leslie said, the Tonto Makud, uh, their successors over the years have existed for, for decades in Haiti. Um, one read, writer I, I read recently called them, they provide the deadly muscle. They have provided the deadly muscle for various uh, administrations and presidents. So it, it's nothing new. I think what we see that is new, especially in these last few months, is the scale, the methodology, and the brazenness of the gangs. I would say that the change though began back in 2018, 2019. And here I link it to the broader issues of corruption and governance. When you had a huge social movement beginning with the Petro Caribe scandal and a demand from the thousands, I don't think Haiti has ever seen anything in recent years or maybe ever, the thousands of people that poured into the streets, especially young people using social media demanding accountability, demanding transparency, demanding justice for where did that money go that was supposed to provide some of the social services that are so sorely missing in most Haitians' lives. And I think the old guard was really shaken by the, by the extent and the, and the intensity and the numbers and the persistence of this social movement, which they had never seen before. And there, you can almost match it, graph it to an uptick in Use of gangs, too, were part of the repression, but you had the buildup of gangs that were targeting, in particular, the parts of Port-au-Prince, especially, that were most identified with the opposition, as it was called, with people claiming their rights and, and, their, and, and justice for what happened, not only for Petro-Caribe funding, but just overall corruption and poor governance. 
and there you have the first massacres in, in La Saline and, and then later in, in Bel Air and, and, C and Cité Soleil, documented by the UN, uh, concluded uh, Harvard Law School's law clinic this past spring issued a report basically concluding that to the extent of this violence would amount to crimes against humanity, that they were widespread and systematic, targeting uh, with a government plan, a government involvement, either promotion, acquiescence, turning the uh, head, willful blindness. But that's a pretty strong conclusion that I would agree with. So that level of violence has really was building up, starting with this drive to have a new Haitian state, a new governance, more transparency, and a reaction of the old guard. And that's what I mean about this is, could be seen as a struggle between those who want to maintain the old state and those who want to change it. And now today's headlines, I, I ask a question. I'd love to hear what other panelists think. I, I question now, do, do those who created those gangs, supported them, armed them, acquiesced to their actions, benefited from their actions, have they created now a Frankenstein they cannot control any longer? I just put that question out there, seeing what's been going on in the last few days. Port-au-Prince is now encircled by gangs, geographically, north, east, and south. West is the, is the bay, and in some cases, the bay is the only safe way to move things by boat. I know a, a, a priest who's a doctor who has a clinic, and now he gets his oxygen tanks and ventilators because he has COVID patients by boat. They come into a, a wharf in Port-au-Prince, and then he has a tug that brings them to a pier where his hospital is. It's the only safe way to move it and everyone is affected. Point two on the institutional breakdown. Institutions don't just collapse on their own. It takes concerted intentional efforts. And here I just wanna read a brief quote from the French ambassador, the ex-French ambassador, Jose Gomez. He gave a long interview to the Nouvelliste, which I really recommend people reading. But in that interview, he says, this is the French ambassador now saying, my view of the situation is that the Haitian state has been infiltrated by businessmen, by mafia groups, who siphon off large amounts from public finances, who block, who, sorry, who hijack massive amounts of, of Haiti's public funds, who oppose advances in democratic governance, who oppose democratic control over the use of public resources. I believe as long as this problem is not resolved, Haiti will not be able to advance. And I think he's absolutely right. Uh, the police have been politicized and infiltrated by some of these groups and types. There are some good police, many that are not so good, uh, but they are clearly been weakened and now part of the problem. The courts for many years have been subject to interference, uh, pressure. We've had already just in the Moise case, uh, prosecutors resigning, judges running away, court clerks getting death threats. Um, tragically, this is nothing new for Haiti, but the justice system basically is at the beck and call of the same elite that runs everything else. Point three on impunity. There's an old Haitian proverb there's a whole Haitian problem for everything, uh, but laws are papier, bayonets are fair. Uh, laws are paper, bayonets are steel. And unfortunately, that's what it's linked to the second point about the courts, but also this really links to impunity. People literally have been getting away with murder in Haiti for quite a long time. I won't go into all the cases, just to name a few that people probably are familiar with. E. Mallory, Minister of Justice, gunned down with his four bodyguards, broad daylight in the middle of Port au Prince, 28th anniversary of his killing was just the other day. Jean Dominique, uh, most renowned Haitian journalist in, in Haitian history, he and his driver gunned down as they pulled into the radio station, Radio Haiti in the year 2000. More recently, Montferrier Dorval, the batonnier, the head of the Port-au-Prince Bar Association, who lived just a few streets away from President Moise, was gunned down in his house in August 2020 after giving a radio interview that was very critical of the president and corruption and governance. governance. And then you have the Moise case itself just a few months ago. None of these cases have, has ever resolved in a prosecution, someone held accountable and sent to prison. And I would not be shocked if that's the result, sadly, in the Moise case too. And on the counter, counter to that, you have somebody like Jimmy Cherizier, back to the gangs, the leader of the G9 group that Leslie mentioned, who's been implicated in several of the massacres, uh, who's on the Treasury Department's U.S. watch list. Um, he goes on Sunday and lays a wreath a floral wreath at the site of Desalines assassination 215 years ago, um, and has fine. He's there with cameramen and lots of uh, guards and escorts, and the acting prime minister himself, who tried to lay a wreath at that same site, was chased away by the gangs. And there's my Frankenstein point again. What, what, have, what have we got here? So quickly now to finish, what to do? I have a few points I'd like to make 
uh, Ambassador Foote and the Montana court itself have some good ideas I'm going to poach right now or just repeat. One is vet carefully a group 500, 600 police uh, who would be trained and equipped to do uh, gang, anti-gang work, to do investigations, arrests, and really know what they're doing. They would need support from intelligence, uh, have good intelligence and all the support they would need, but that's somewhere to start with the police. They're not all beyond uh, saving. You would need special prosecutors, who, again, specially trained. You could have fast track cases, all with due process and fair trials, but so that these cases just don't languish and never go anywhere. And then you would have to have humane prisons to keep them in. Um, what, and that would be for the gang leaders, the, the, the guys who really are profiting the most from this and who are responsible. For the gang members, most of these are poor young men. I'm not excusing what they're doing, but they have no prospects, no future, no jobs. And so it's quite easy to recruit them. Uh, and that's what's been happening. Uh, so how, and these are the groups that, again, have been I, just left behind by the state, ignored and, and, and just not helped at all. So uh, a couple of ideas. One, Viva Rio, which is a fantastic uh, Brazilian NGO that has lots of experience in the favelas in, in Rio and also has done a lot of work in Haiti, has in the past had some very good programs diverting. They don't try to destroy or dismantle the gangs, but they divert a lot of the members with really good programs, job training, literacy, computers, sports, arts, very effective programs in Bel Air and Matisson and other places that, that need it the most to give these young people a future or some hope. The other uh, initiative which would be more governmental is the 1987 constitution provides for a civilian, a civilian service corps. It's never existed uh, in, in, 30, in 34 years, but why not start now? And this would be a government run project why not focus on youth that would focus on environmental campaigns, reforestation, first aid training, you name it. There's so much that needs to be done in Haiti. But again, it would give youth some experience, some positive interactions with the state and some tools and skills to build a life. Um, there's no reason why that can't be done. And I would argue, why spend money on the Haitian army? That's the time and energy and money. Spend it on this kind of initiative. You, you do much more good for the country. And lastly, get control of the weapons. I mean, the weapon flows into Haiti are unbelievable. When you see these guys walking around with the type of weapons they have, where do they come from? And mostly from the United States. They come either directly from the US or via Jamaica. I think the US government would spend half the time and energy uh, it spends currently on keeping Haitians out of the United States. If it spent a little bit of that on keeping guns and munitions out of Haiti, not so many Haitians would be trying to get out of Haiti in the first place. So I'll just conclude with, with that. I just, I, final remark is that dealing with the gangs and the violence in Haiti, if you're gonna deal with it successfully, would be part of a process where you are changing Haiti from a, what it has been, which is a predatory, oppressive state that keeps a tiny number of people in wealth and power and transform that state into one that actually provides and serves for the vast majority of Haitians. That's what the struggle is all about. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, that's a lofty goal, but an important one to keep in mind for the future. Uh, before I turn to Monique, I just want to alert all of our um, public that uh, in the chat, my colleague Stephanie has posted our most recent report on Haiti, A Path for Stability. You can find it there in English, in Spanish, and in French, um, in case you haven't had a chance to, to look at. Uh, Monique, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you very much for the International uh, Crisis Group for uh, honoring me by inviting me to this panel. I also want to thank the, the first day uh, too a presenters, Leslie and a Bill O'Neill for making a, my task so much easier for setting up this narrative in terms of some of the main issues, some of the main a, critical problems and the historical perspective also of this narrative. But I think one of the consequences of what a Leslie and Bill have said is the population and the civil society institutions, the powerlessness that one feels from what Leslie and Bill have described. And I think this is where uh, I come in 
with the civil society perspective and what has been going on. A little bit has been mentioned in terms of the anti-corruption movement, but the idea is how to go from the powerlessness of the civil society that was felt to the empowerment and really becoming a force to be reckoned with, with a policy agenda. So this is where a, I, will, a, I will intervene. To say that a, the process is as important as the content in a, what I will be a saying. Bill has talked a little bit about the content, a, Leslie also in terms of the a, civil society a, commission for a Haitian led a solution to the crisis. I believe that uh, in January, there was a huge forum, a civil society, various civil society organizations that got together and said, we are tired of complaining because although complaining is also something that is important to do, but we really want to take action. We no longer want to be spectators to what is going on. We want to be actors. We want to be right there in the movement to be influencing what is going on, the solutions to Haiti. And they put together then this uh, civil society commission. And it was important because the mandate that they gave us is actually somewhat different than the mandate that we understood. And we decided to put Haitian led solution Haitienne in our name. And it is not by accident. And it deals with a lot of what Leslie has said in terms of this almost stranglehold that the international community has on Haitians. And we want it, and this is what we have done in terms of a Haitian-led solution. It had to come from us. And when we started in terms of the commission, it's a 13-member a, so a commission that has different a civil society sectors from the Protestant a Federation, the feminist platform, human rights platforms, union a leaders, the Bar Association, a, the voodoo a sector, the Episcopalian a church. So various sectors, as well as three members who are a committed a, a analyst and committed a people known for their integrity and who have taken public a positions. So in terms of the process, I think one of the elements that I really want to highlight is the inclusive element. A lot of people say the solution has to be inclusive as if inclusive is a, the, the end product. No, inclusive for what? And inclusive who should be involved in it? And one of the things that we decided from the beginning was that inclusive meant particularly people who have been excluded as Leslie mentioned, from the, the public space, from the public dialogue, people who have no say in what is going on and what has been going on in Haiti. So one of the things that we did was not only talk to the different sectors who sent us to the commission, but we also reached out to the popular organizations, the militants de Chanmas, the various Force d'Elma, the, the various popular sector, which is extremely important, which drives a lot of the protest movements, but who are not considered as part of the solution. As if the solution has to be, well, you put together the power, the people in power, in that case, PHTK, and then the political uh, group, uh, there. No, what about us, the population? What about us who have been in the fringes, in the margins for so long? So the inclusive meant that. And another important sector also that we reached out for was the diaspora, 
from the very beginning of the uh, of the commission, we reached out to the diaspora. To about 200 to 300 organizations and personalities were were part of the process. We had, I don't know how many Zooms that we had with them, exchanges, letters, et cetera, for them to be involved. And we went on a listening tour, not only of them, but of various sectors. And I think that is important because everybody thinks they know what the crisis is, but we wanted to know what the crisis was from them and what the solutions were for them. So the aspect of inclusiveness of usually excluded groups, as well as the others, I believe is extremely important, as well as the participation of many so that they can speak, et cetera. So I think the, this, these are extremely important aspects. Another dimension, which I think is extremely important in the process was what I always called finding the least common denominator. What is it that we could all agree on? We don't need to be, it doesn't need to be unanimous, but we need to be able to agree on certain values, on certain principles. And these, are, these were drivers for us in the commission to consider and to put in action. So the process, apart from the participation, the inclusiveness, had that element of what could be, what can we find a consensus on? What is the consensus agenda? And we came up with some of the items that I will talk about when uh, I mention uh, the content aspect. So we started, and I say it really with a lot of humility, and they know they beating the stomach and saying how wonderful this is. But it really is a movement to re-engineer democracy so that people, the voice of the people, and it, it's not said in, a, a, in a, any demagogic a manner. It really is said that a, we wanted to make sure that democracy is about the voice of the people. But in Haiti, it kind of became who you want to put in power, who the United States and the international community wanted to be in power and then fast track the elections. No, and as has been shown is that the last election since the 1991 elections that Leslie talked about, Haitians kind of systematically, it went downhill in terms of participation. It went downhill in terms of interest even as the international community was organizing their elections, Haitians kind of removed themselves from the process and said, well, you go ahead and you do it. And so as soon as the people are in power, they're contested because the voices were not the voices of the people. You had a slim majority, sometimes in the case of Jovenel Moïse, less than one fourth of the, one fifth even, 18% of the electorate. So this re-engineering of the democracy, the rebuilding trust is one, one of the, uh, really key critical uh, things that happened in the process of the commission actually getting then to an agreement. So that movement is something that is important. And another uh, aspect before I get to the content, we actually told the, uh, the international community who reached out to us practically days after we started working. No, we're not interested in talking to you. Not now. We want to talk to Haitians because the idea was to put us in a way perhaps under control or tell us what our agenda needed to be. And it was an important thing to say that. And we spent about two months talking to Haitians, talking to ourselves to find out what we wanted to talk. Then, Yes, we talked to the international community, we listened to them, we reached out to them, but I think that was an important element. Now, in terms of the content of what we have come up 
in terms of the civil society. So it is, a Leslie mentioned that, and I think Bill mentioned that, it is commonly called the Montana Accord. And it is a, we call it the Accord du 30 août, because that was the day that we started the, the signing of it. It has a, a, yes, it has really two parts. It has the political a governance a aspect, which is a Leslie mentioned that he's part of the coordination of the monitoring a bureau of the a accord. And we move forward then with the Conseil National de Transition, which is really the, to put together a kind of proxy voters a, who will vote for the president and the prime minister, because it is a mechanism. It is not person driven. It is not leader driven. It is driven by that same democratic transparent process. And I think that is an element that is of fundamental a, importance and a, as well as having a watchdog. So there is that governance aspect of it. And then there is the a, really the policy the social justice agenda. Because one of the things that's important is that Haitians this time have been protesting for three years. And I think a Leslie set up very well the aspect of the inequality that has run throughout our history. I always say that, yes, we assured ourselves of the liberty in 1804, but we didn't pay attention to the liberty equality part of it and the, the, the massive uh, inequality. So this begins to address some of what the people in the streets were saying, because people had been in the streets before the massacres. Uh, people had been in the street actually asking for what? Social justice, health, education. They were asking for that. They were asking for anti-corruption. They were asking for anti-impunity as Bill has mentioned. So the, it really was a social agenda. I remember meeting a woman in the street who said, oh my God, there was all this money and they stole it. And here I was suffering, trying to send my child to school. And I think Haitians started to understand that $4 billion could have made the difference in transforming the society, but no, they stole it. They stole it. So this movement has, a, this a, agreement has that aspect. Knowing fully well that it is a two year agreement, it can fast track, it can start, it can give hope, it can trace, it can give a path. And this is what the agreement does in terms of that. There is also a the justice a aspect. Bill Monica, has sorry, to, just to let you know, you've been a little bit over time. If you can wrap up in one or two minutes, is that possible? Will do, absolutely. There is a justice aspect and Bill has talked about that. So I think that is something that perhaps I don't need to talk about. So basically there is, it has a, rights-based agenda that has social, uh, the social justice as the social justice aspect, as well as the real uh, justice aspect. And uh, Leslie has talked about the New Deal. So just wanted to say that the New Deal is not only about the content, but it is also about the process that I talked about and also telling the international community, please stand back. Please let us be, please let us define our path, find our way. What we need from you is your solidarity. We, knew, we do not need your meddling. We want to do this and we can do this. This is the new deal that we are talking about, a new relationship with ourselves and a new relationship with our institutions, a new relationship with our government that will be 
our government and not the government of the international community and a new relationship with the international community, be it bilateral or multinational. Thank you. Thanks so much, Monique. I, I think that solidarity and not meddling, uh, Ashish is writing that down <laughs> to share with his human colleagues, I am, I am sure, but uh, a very concrete and interesting way of putting it. Um, okay, Jacqueline, the floor is yours. Yes, hi, good morning. Thanks for inviting me um, to be here. Uh, Johnny McCullough, who for years headed one of the more recognized um, and powerful Haitian rights group this morning tweeted um, something, and I just want to read it to get us started because it builds on what Monique said. And he tweeted, you know, major international media discovers Haiti in 2021, just like Columbus did in 1492. Meanwhile, Haitians have been campaigning against lawlessness like forever. What do you think the petro Caribe protests were all about? And I think you can say that not just about um, most of the international media, with the exception of the Miami Herald, where I work. Uh, but you can also say that, too, about the current you know, US administration. Uh, I'm thinking back to earlier this year, shortly after President Biden took office, my colleague, Nora Gomez Torres, who covers Cuban US policy, we wrote a story about you know, what the Biden administration faces in terms of Latin American policy. But we highlighted Haiti, because at the time, there were protests um, there were um, pushback against then President Jovenel Moise um, and the various decrees that he was passing while ruling by decree in order to strengthen his power under the presidency. There was the whole issue of the constitution, um, the new constitution that he was pushing for um, outside of the laws of the current constitution, according to most Haitians. Um, a vast majority of Haitian scholars. And yet there was a silence on the part of the US and other administrations, even if they were talking to the president privately, the problem is, is nobody was hearing this publicly. And what we were hearing publicly was this push for elections, elections, elections now. Today, you know, the Biden administration, you know, has already faced various crises as we warned them was going to happen with Haiti. Um, there's been an electoral crisis with no parliament or locally elected officials, an assassinated president, a devastating earthquake and deadly storm, a surge of Haitian migrants at the U.S. southern border, and now the taking of American hostages. Let me just say that, you know, it's interesting with this, you know, this kidnapping that involves, you know, 16 Americans. Um, and one Canadian, first of all, these are not the, Amer the first Americans to be kidnapped this year or foreigners. There have been at least um, 25 before this. Uh, this, I think, has brought the attention because of the large group. This is the first time we're hearing about a large group. But Haitians, hundreds of Haitians have been subjected to kidnappings um, for quite some time now. And in many of those cases, they have been you know, Haitian Americans. But because Haiti is now once again in the headlines, you have an administration that's now faced with the question in terms of what do you do? You know, what are the options that are that are available for a country that's just 700 miles off the coast of Florida, where U.S. policy towards Haiti has always been about, you know, a migration crisis in terms of keeping Haitians out. Well, today we saw that that migration crisis showed up at the southern border of the United States, which nobody should have been surprised by. Leslie talked about in terms of Haitians who have been migrating to Latin America. But in 2016, when we had the first Haitian migration crisis at the U.S. southern border, and with that, we saw the Obama administration at the time removed a six-year moratorium on deportations to Haiti. People seem to forget that. But that crisis, ironic enough, came after the 2010 earthquake, which was supposed to be a moment of change. We had the heavy involvement of the U.S. at the time in terms of, you know, where a new industrial park was going to be. Um, in terms of the elections that took place both in 2010 and 2015. So one has to ask yourself, with all of this involvement, particularly by the U.S., how did we get to where, you know, to, to where we are? And of course, we can spend time debating that. But I think the Biden administration today has to figure out what its Haiti policy is going to be. Um, the criticism that has come out of the international community from some of their various partners, including the Dominican Republic, is that it's been ambiguous. It's not clear. When you hear from the State Department, you hear one thing. You hear you talk to the White House, it's something else. I'm thinking back to when Daniel Foote. 
before he um, resigned his post as U.S. Special Envoy, I was actually moderating a discussion on Haiti that FIU had, and you know he was talking about you know training and anti-gang units to address the whole issue of corruption and how this country cannot go to elections without dealing with the security problem. That same day. Um, Carrie Jean Pierre, as a deputy spokesperson, is, you know, is having a press conference in Washington with journalists about Haiti, and the focus was about elections. So right there, I'm hearing two different two different messages. Even now today, the U.S. says, you know, they put the whole issue about elections on the back end of the sentence when conditions apply. But you can't help but wonder, you know, my money is like on January, where we'll probably start seeing this renewed call for elections. You have the commission that is calling for a transition. You have others who, who you know, are still sort of saying we're in a transition or we need to be in a transition. But I have not yet heard um, the United States basically take a position in terms of whether or not they will support um, a transition or think that Haiti can sustain a two-year transition. Their position in the past is that Haiti's not Belgium and it cannot sustain two years without, you know, without a government. But how do you go to elections when you have, you know, the lawlessness that you have today? You have gangs basically controlling everything, preventing, you know, the, the prime minister from even laying a wreath of flowers. How, how do you convince people who increasingly don't believe in democracy or this version of it that's been handed to Haiti um, that they should go and that there is power, you know, in their vote. So I think that all of those are things that the Biden administration is going to have to deal with, it, but specifically the security issue. And if they think they're just sort of throwing money at a police force that the U.S. has backed, has spent more than $300 million on in the past 10 years, that that's all suddenly going to solve the problem, then it's not because this is a police force that was not even able to protect his own president from being assassinated. When President Jovenel Moise was killed on the 7th of July, his security forces were there in his yard. They were not, they were not away. So imagine for just the average citizen that's there. You have a force today that is also demoralized. They're underpaid. Um, they have issues of corruption. Um, you know, where is the motivation for them to now go take on the gangs, much less are they trained to do so? So, you know, I think the first step for them is going to figure out what they want in terms of Haiti and how they're going to assist Haiti and how are they going to address the, the, the need for institutions. And that's one of the things in the conversations that we're not hearing in terms of this is a country where the institutions have completely collapsed. You know, and when we look at, you know, countries around the region that have gone through difficult times and crises, one of the things that they've had is the ability to lean on their institutions regardless of who is sitting you know, in the presidential palace. And today they're, they're, they are non-existent in Haiti. I think for the diaspora, you know, they themselves are finding themselves at a, at a crossroads, right? You had a diaspora that was heavily, heavily involved in Haiti for years, especially during the years of the RSD administration. They're, they they were dreams of returning and retiring in Haiti. They were buying land. They were looking to have businesses. And then the earthquake happened. And then after the earthquake, there was an election. And what I saw with that election, as somebody who covers this, this, this community and sits in Miami, which has the largest you know, Haitian diaspora you know, in the US, um, is that people were removing themselves, disengaging. They started to sort of give up hope of, 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 of Haiti, of returning to Haiti, of a life in Haiti. And we started to see that in the US reflected in increasing number of Haitian Americans, not just here, but in New York, New Jersey, running for office and winning. People being much more concerned about whether or not you know, their, their water bill was justifiable or whether they had sidewalks in their communities as opposed to what was happening in, in, in Haiti. And that was really a reflection of, of, I think, US policy at the time and towards, you know, in the elections and what happened there. Recently with the migration crisis on the border, what we started to see and we heard, and I find it to be sort of very telling is that the more, the outrage came more out of the diaspora than it came from within Haiti you know, in terms of the U.S. treatment of, of Haitians at the border, the return, the repatriations, um, you know, of, of, of Haitians. And I think it's a reflection of something else. Haiti's middle class is in its diaspora. It's not, you know, it's, it, it's not in the country. And the people who are financing to these journeys or helping these journeys are people who are, you know, um, in the diaspora. I think that there is still work to be done in terms of the diaspora and engagement. The diaspora is just divided as Haitians are in Haiti. There are hundreds and hundreds of diaspora groups. You also have shocking for position there. Um, they, I haven't fully seen an attempt to truly try and organize them, organize themselves. Um, and, you know, but 
what I am hearing is in terms of the elections that's, that's coming, people are so angry that I think that it's going to be very telling in terms of the midterm elections in the United States and whether or not Haitians go and have their voices heard at the ballot box in the U.S. and how they go and, and, and have their voices heard. And I think that is also an issue for this Biden administration, which today found, you know, just at a moment where the, the administration was trying to show that it was more engaged in Haiti, that it was looking to sort of change Haiti policy, President Biden himself was personally getting briefed on you know, what was happening after the August 14th earthquake. Today, we we're told that he's also being briefed on the situation with the hostages and what the FBI is doing. But then he got this migration crisis that slams at him. So you, and you have this domestic issue affects foreign policy. And even today in terms of the security in Haiti and what do you do, um, it's being guided by the domestic issues in the United States. So they've got a tall order, but I think the first and foremost is they have to decide, the U.S. has to decide what it wants its policy to be and how it then is going to go about in carrying that policy. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. I think that's a very, um, this is the perfect bridge for issues to speak about, obviously, the, the role that the U.N. has had and uh, should have in, in the coming months in Haiti, considering the, the long history of, of that organization's presence. Ashish. Thank you, Renata, and thanks, uh, everyone. Uh, really glad to be on here. Uh, I thought I would uh, focus on, as you said, Renata, on the U.N.'s role, uh, both uh, in terms of discussions in New York, uh, but also dynamics on the ground and then focus in on dynamics also at the Security Council. And you know, the first part of uh, my remarks will be similar to Jacqueline's in terms of posing a number of questions. And I think when it comes to the situation in Haiti, uh, you know, the, the focus uh, for Crisis Group and, and for me and what I've been tracking for, for the, the recent months, you know, especially since President Moyes' assassination, uh, is uh, the, the number of dilemmas that the organization faces. Uh, you know, especially at a time when the institution itself is facing uncertainty, uncertainties about uh, what its own presence on the ground will look like in the months ahead. Um, there have been understandable difficulties uh, that the UN has faced in grappling with the uh, multiple crises, both political, security, and uh, humanitarian uh, crises on the ground. Uh, but at the same time, really unhelpful dynamics at the Security Council, which I'll get to in the, the latter part of my remarks, have served as firstly a distraction, but also pose some real potential headaches uh, for the organization uh, moving forward. Uh, so, the, you know, the, really the principal challenge uh, for the UN, as uh, you know, for uh, most other international actors, is uh, how to address the election dilemma. I think this is something that Crisis Group, you know, we uh, outlined in our uh, recent report. And you know, for the UN, uh, I think it's clear that the focus thus far has been on making sure that they do what they can to provide support, to deliver elections, to mark an end to this turbulent period, you know, which would also, you know, in theory, uh, you know, uh, address the gaps in legitimacy, you know, which have been uh, apparent you know, ever since uh, the latter periods of President Moyes' tenure, even obviously before his assassination. Uh, but you know, there are a number of questions that this raises. Uh, I think one of those questions is, how does the UN account for the important role uh, of civil society and the Commission for a Haitian Solution uh, have played you know, uh, in recent months. Now, obviously, in addition to the voices within uh, the official leadership of the country, you know, including Prime Minister uh, Henri, um, you know, how does the UN address, for example, the outcomes of the inclusive process that Monique outlined you know, uh, so, so thoroughly, you know, which are really geared towards rebuilding trust and you know, trying to find a different path than you know, what's been tried before. And you know, I can uh, certainly uh, give you a little bit of insight in terms of some of our internal discussions at Crisis Group, including with uh, several of you uh, on the screen about how to, you know, we as an organization try to find uh, ways that we can recommend a different route from the, the various methods that have been tried before. And you know, certainly, you know, I think there's an argument to be made that this sort of inclusive bottom-up process that's uh, come out with a uh, you know sort of comprehensive list of demands and a certain pathway forward you know, at the very least warrants uh, you know of listening to but then how much of that does the UN take on board you know how does the the UN grapple with uh, you know these sorts of 
uh, engagements from uh, non-governmental actors, uh, you know, versus governmental actors. And I think that's been a, a delicate balance that the, the UN still is is uh, trying to sort of figure out. And so far, you know, understandably, uh, the UN has been cautious to not get overly involved, not being seen as taken sides. And uh, you know, this is a, a wise decision, I think, you know, for the most part, because you know, as Monique again you know, stated very clearly, uh, there is a desire, you know, among Haitian uh, actors, including within civil society. To really you know, drive this process forward and not be uh, seen as uh, having uh, uh, conditions and outcomes imposed on them. Um, so you know, while the UN wants to support, it also uh, is, is conscious of not getting too involved, uh, but at the same time it will have to deal with the fallout in some shape or form on the ground. And you know, for example, you know, if we have a situation in the months ahead where uh, other international actors uh, you know, bilaterally, you know, from their national positions, for example, do decide to back outcomes that are seen as going against the desires of Haitian civil society actors. How does the UN grapple with that? Will the UN have to, you know, you know, face part of the brunt of the backlash that might emerge from that? I think, you know, those are the sorts of conversations that uh, you know, will be important to, to see, you know, how the organization uh, sort of deals with. And, you know, from Prices Group's view, you know, this election dilemma and, uh, you know, how not just the UN, but you know other broader international actors, um, you know, position themselves around that. Uh, to us, is clear. You know, the, our view organizationally, as we again outlined in our report, is that you know both the elections and this uh, you know contentious constitutional referendum, you know, th th these processes should not be the immediate priority. You know, it really should be about uh, you know focus should be on addressing the the challenges. You know, all of the challenges that all of the esteemed speakers that went before me have already outlined. You know, which then brings to to the core. I think you know one of the the most uh, pertinent but also tricky questions. Now, how does the UN balance Balance this focus on end date versus end state. Does the UN, like other some other international actors, you know, focus on finding uh, a clear date to hold elections you know, as soon as feasible, uh, and try to sort of uh, you know go ahead uh, you know on, on that route as as quickly as possible again to to bookend uh, this transitional period, or does it try to focus on creating you know, as much of a uh, uh, an appropriate end state uh, you know to enable as credible of a poll and a process as possible? Uh, again, you know, we haven't seen those questions completely answers to those questions from the UN completely. Uh, articulated as yet, and you know, there's still a bit of time, you know, before we get into 2022, and when uh, elections, uh, there'll be sort of more of a the drumbeat of elections will will start to be sound again. But I think you know how the the UN positions itself around those key questions will be uh, you know important to see. But unfortunately, now sort of switching to the Security Council and sort of the role of the member states in and around the UN. Hopefully, you know, the the remarks I'm about to to share will give you a little bit of insight into sometimes how uh, handicapped the international community is on Haiti. You know, this might be anecdotal in a sense, but uh, you know, given all of these big picture questions, uh, the fact that the UN is facing real uncertainties about, about its future uh, you know, are a, a potential problem. Uh, as we at Crisis Group have observed for really the past year, but particularly in the past couple of weeks, uh, there's been a lot of pressure on the UN's special political mission on the ground, uh, BINU, uh, by some of the uh, more powerful members of the Security Council uh, who would like the mission to uh, uh, exit uh, the country. Now, this is a you know, relatively small mission, just over 100 staff, $20 million uh, annual budget, you know, which uh, is, is serving to uh, strengthen political stability, good governance, uh, pr protect and promote human rights, um, and you know, also you know, do things like support uh, elections, uh, greater police professionalism, you know, and uh, justice reform, a number of things, for example, that Bill touched on you know, in terms of important interventions that the international community can focus on. The mission is, you know, because of its uh, limited resources, is, you know, isn't able to provide the kind of long-term support that you know, Bill uh, underscored, but still you know, it, it has in terms of its toolbox uh, a, a number of, of useful um, uh, mandated tasks. However, uh, because of uh, geopolitical and national interest reasons, uh, China and Russia have had this mission in their crosshairs you know, for the past year or, or two years. Um, you know, in particular, you know, with the argument that they're taking that this operation represents unnecessary expenditures for the UN, given the lack of progress on the ground, given the fact that you know, Haitian actors have not been able to, uh, you know, take the country forward, uh, etc. Um, and and they're arguing that now that the time is right to start uh, to shut this mission down and to leave uh, you know Haitian actors to their own devices. 
you know, there will be some support from the UN country team, but this special political mission can shutter its uh, its doors. Uh, this is risky for a number of reasons. You know, needless to say, you know, both symbolically and materially, withdrawing from the country at a critical juncture, while it's still dealing with you know this sort of triple political, security, humanitarian crises, uh, is uh, uh, would be haphazard, and I think in, in our view, uh, but. Uh, you know, uh, how can, you know, I think the, the question that a number of other uh, council members have been asking is how can the UN, you know, potentially justify, you know, reducing its presence and exiting the country when, you know, there's still so much work to be done. Um, and, uh, you know, as a result, you know, there was a lot of pushback, you know, just in the last week, you know, in negotiations that only concluded on Friday. So, you know, a lot of this is fresh. Uh, but you know, negotiations that concluded on Friday to buy the mission more time, and so what happened was the the, the United States, you know, which leads council discussions on Haiti issues at the Security Council, was able to buy nine months for the mission so it can continue its work for that period. However, in six months' time. Uh, the uh, UN Secretariat and the Secretary General will have to uh, deliver a report to the Council, uh, you know, with a sort of a review on how to adjust this mission and its tasks and its mandates to fit the the requirements on the ground. Now, what China wants to do with this um, uh, review process and assessment is use it as again uh, the the springboard to argue. Okay, now is the time to, to shut this mission down. Um, and you know, as much as you know, part of the argument, publicly stated argument, has been to save the UN's unnecessary expenditures, uh, there's geopolitical reasons behind this as well because you know, China uh, is uh, you know really unhappy with uh, Haiti's uh, official ties with Taiwan, and you know we've seen uh, you know heightened U.S.-China tensions on Taiwan uh, of late, and this has been strangely. Uh, one forum where those tensions have uh, had an impact on something completely unrelated, which is the future of Haiti, which has nothing to do with Taiwan. Uh, Russia as well, you know, I think from what we've heard from other council members, uh, has been taking positions where, uh, you know, it's uh, maybe trying to use this as a uh, as a forum for, uh, you know, pushing some of its uh, um, adversarial uh, uh, states in the region. Uh, you know, and, and putting some pressure on them, you know, especially uh, Colombia, you know, by pushing on the international investigations into Moises assassination. So all of this to say that, you know, these dynamics that again have nothing to do with Haiti could you know, pose some real questions and, and problems to UN officials, staff you know, working on the ground, you know, doing whatever they, they can to support, you know, the various reforms and processes that I outlined earlier. Now, what happens in six months time and nine months time, you know, could be divorced from the reality on the ground. And you know, what does that mean for the Security Council and the UN? You know, it could mean uh, yet another uh, you know, really uh, a blot in its record. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, we at Crisis Group have covered, the inability of the council to respond to crises, uh, unfortunately. And you know, I think this would uh, you know be the sort of the, the latest case where you know, international actors are hamstrung by their inability to to provide the kind of interventions in a country like Haiti, you know, facing all these crises because of a number of either big power tensions or tensions between big powers and smaller powers. So I'll end there, and I'd be happy to go into uh, more about UN uh, priorities, Security Council dynamics in the Q and A, and looking forward to the interactions. Thanks so much, Ashish. Thank you, everybody, uh, for a very interesting conversation. We unfortunately do not have a lot of time for, for um, exchange and Q&As, but we do have around 15 minutes, maybe a little bit more if people are willing to stay uh, slightly late. So I invite our audience to uh, type any questions that they might have in the, um, in the Q&A uh, button. Um, and I will begin with a couple that, that have already come in. Um, and, and there is a lot of interest, obviously, uh, in the audience, and <clears throat> as there has been before, about the idea that Bill was putting forward about a special prosecution for guns and how that would work. Uh, <clears throat> I would be very interested in hearing from Leslie and Monique how, from the Haitian perspective, uh, this is taken. Is it this seen as a good idea or or, a, or another way of the international community meddling, given the possibility that, that it will have to be heavily supported by, by, by the international community. And, and one of our audience members is asking uh, particularly about the way in which the US or other core groups would be able to investigate or document and sanction corrupt political and economic elites to deter the continued fueling of the organized crime, right? Is how is it enough to just prosecute the gang leaders if we know that the elites are funding these gangs um, and they can just find new heads, how to cut that sort of um, cycle 
of of supporting the 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 gangs that that Leslie very well explained is something that has historically occurred in in Haiti for for many decades. Um, and somebody else is asking, um, how do you guys feel that racism plays a role in the law, historical meddling, and control driven interventions by the international community towards Haiti? Um, and how do we put this on the agenda? Do you guys see linkages between the Black Lives Matter movement in the US or the Afro-Caribbean movements in the region? Uh, how is this being part of, of the social movements uh, that are seen in the, in the island? And finally, a question that, that is perhaps sort of an over, like an umbrella question to a lot of what we have discussed today, which is the question of how to, strengthen the state when the international community is getting this um, lesson that the state is incredibly unable to step up to the task. And so uh, the idea is to work very closely with the civil society. Uh, but how do we do both things simultaneously, right? We wanna be in consultation with the civil society. We wanna respond very much as Monique said, very clearly to the needs of civil society. But at the same time, understanding that the Haitian state needs to work properly, uh, as Bill said, uh, to stop being just a, a, a Haitian state that works only for a few to really uh, look for the better lives for, for most Haitians. So how do we do that simultaneously? And how do we understand uh, that tension? Um, and finally, there is a question for uh, perhaps for, for Jacqueline about the Haitian diaspora and how much um, do you think they have the ear of the Biden administration in a way in which the social process that Monique describes so richly could maybe perhaps gain some support from the US administration? Is Do they have the ear? Do they have the reach? Um, so perhaps I'll start with Leslie, if, if that's okay. Leslie, you, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry. Um, thank you, Renata. I will start with the racism issue. Um, I think that uh, Haiti has been punished because of its original sin. And the original sin has been to abolish slavery and to have fought the best armies, uh, uh, the Napoleonic armies, the British armies, and we have like a uh, hundred thousand corps of soldiers in the in our in our country, and uh, also uh, it was occupied by the U.S. and the U.S. sent the Marines, which were uh, formed by the Louis in, in Louisiana and in Arkansas under the Jim Crow system, and uh, all that relation uh, is tinted with racism. We, we can see it, we can feel it, and we have been uh, neglected by the US for uh, 200 years since Jefferson put a veto on, on Haiti, and it's, it's been there. Sorry. Thank you, Leslie. Um, Monique, I'm not turning to you, but allow me to ask you a couple of things, questions that just came in that I think very much speak to your presentation, uh, which is about um, how much consensus there is in Haiti um, and how much consensus can the Montana Agreement really build? Does this include the old guard? Does this include members of the gangs? Like, is there a possibility to build a consensus even with those sectors that are, um, you know, we, that we're seeing as problematic? Um, and are there legitimate concerns about going the route proposed by the Montana Accord? What else might be needed to address those concerns? Yes. Um, well, uh, excuse me. I thank you. I I know that there is uh, sufficient a critical consensus. And as I mentioned, I don't know that we need to be unanimous. The unanimity is not what is looked for, but consensus is what is looked for and sufficient consensus to build strength, to be able to talk to your vis-a-vis -vis 
And I think this is what we have done. We, we are right now, I'm in Miami for the last two days and we have been meeting with the diaspora and have found that most of the uh, people we have seen established members of the diaspora knew of the accord. Some of them say, we, we agree with you 75%, 85%, 100%, we back you. And it's because of the process that we have followed to make sure that people were involved. So yes, there is, con there is some consensus, but we believe that it is sufficient consensus to be able to talk to different interlocutors and different stakeholders. For example, the, uh, the Congress, we have been able to talk to the Congress. Our coordinator and other members were invited by the area group to speak to the Security Council. Uh, we have talked to different uh, people, uh, foreign uh, embassies, in the Haiti. So there is, we are taken seriously uh, by uh, a lot of people. No accord is perfect. I mean, the Palestinian Israeli accord is still being contested, even though people move forward with it. So it is not a perfect accord, but there is something there that is a consensus agenda that we can move forward with. I wanted to address another point. I, I am in a way a UN baby. My mother worked for the UN. I've worked for the UN most of my adult life and I'm a retire from the, uh, from the UN. I was a UN official in several different countries. So I know really what the UN uh, works. The, the problem is in Haiti that the BNU has not done what it is supposed to do which is supporting Haiti in terms of the process. We have never met Mrs. Lalim and the Haitian solution, a Haitian led commission in Haiti that has been working in, the, in two weeks, we will be eight months. We've never met her. She has never asked us for a meeting. And I think that says a lot about a lot of the a disdain almost for what it is. It's almost like a, the, the political arm. It is a political arm of the UN. And I think that is one of the issues that uh, is the problem also besides the geopolitical, the Russian. Uh, what Ashish didn't talk about is the way Haitians view the UN, which to me is, you know, I'm in total despair because I've worked for the UN. I believe in the human rights agenda of the UN, but in Haiti, the development and the humanitarian section of the UN is active and is working, but the political arm has not done what it is supposed to do. And I think that is one of the major issues. On another question about the racism, and I think Lissy has talked about that, but one of the things that the commission has done is kind of reached out and says that we need to build alliances with the wretched of the earth, other people who have been excluded, who have been oppressed. We need to do this. And we, we, we really are open, we, we put our arms out and open them very widely to build alliances with a Latin America, with a, a Asian Americans, with the whole social justice movement that said to a uh, America, get your uh, get your knee off our neck, and which has bought in in a sense a uh, Biden, which is why we really have an issue understanding why the international community doesn't understand when we say get your knee off our neck. And we need the same kind of social justice agenda. And uh, so these are some of the elements, I believe, to uh, some of the questions that were, uh, that were asked. So we're open to dialogue. We believe we have built a movement that has some strength, 
Of course, it has weaknesses. We are sure of that. But we feel that there is something sufficient that we can move forward. We are being listened to. We are being taken seriously. People are looking at the agreement and saying it's impressive, it's strong, because we worked on it and because it is a consensus agenda. So uh, let me stop there and uh, willing to uh, respond to other queries. Thank you so much. Uh, Jacqueline. Um, you know, it's an interesting question in terms of whether or not the Haitian diaspora has the ear of the Biden administration. I mean, they clearly have, you know, their contacts in the administration, but I can also tell you what I witnessed with the recent Del Rio migration crisis is that there was a lot of frustrations because there are questions about, am I talking to, to the right persons? Is this a, a give and take conversation? where um, those in charge of administration really are interested in what uh, members of the Haitian diaspora have to say, or is this more of a one-way conversation in terms of here's what we are doing, um, here's who we met with, here's who we spoke to. Um, you did see an effort after the earthquake, for instance, with USAID having meetings with members of the diaspora, talking to them, you know, trying to reassure them that there were lessons learned, for instance, from the 2010 earthquake uh, before um, Brian Nichols and Juan Gonzalez went down to Haiti a few weeks ago. They stopped at Miami where they also met with members um, of, you know, of the Haitian diaspora. Um, again, I think that the situation is, is just so much more sort of complicated um, because every issue sort of comes with um, the drawbacks in terms of the solutions that you try to propose, right? If we take, for instance, just a whole issue on the security, while you know there are some people who would like to see some involvement by the U.S. military because they fear that that's the, they feel that that's the only one the gangs will respect or be afraid of. Um, you've seen disagreement even here in terms of U.S. members of Congress, you know, um, who are saying, well, we don't need another U.S. military, you know, to, you know, to go into Haiti. Um, you know, one of the questions I've been asking as a reporter over and over, okay, everybody recognizes what the problem is in terms of security, but what is to fix? Explain to me, how do you address a security problem with a police force that, you know, that Bill knows, because he and I talk about this all the time, that literally has just been imploding before our very eyes. Um, and yet I haven't heard anything sort of concrete. So I think, you know, one with the diaspora is that they're going to have to find a way to um, speak more of a united front, but they've been burned so many times by hate, Haiti politics um, that they are also, they also sort of shy away, but are more prone to, to address issues in terms of Haitians here and what's happening in Haitians. I think that's why we heard a loud voice in terms of the migration issue and the response to the administration in respect to Haitian migrants um, and they be repatriated back to Haiti. I think there you, you were able to get more of, of sort of, you know, a louder voice on that. But in terms of like Haiti and whether or not they should jump in or not, um, they're sort of, sh you know, shy about it because despite the effort that Monique and those have made to reach out to the diaspora, the reality is, is that when the diaspora go into Haiti, they're often shut out. You know, there is this invisible line in Haiti, you know, to the presidency, to, to this job, to that job. And when the diaspora comes in with their foreign education, foreign money, there's a, there's a, there's a threat that, 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 you know, is implied there. And so they're sort of, you know, I mean, pushed away. So, um, so I think that those are, 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 are the challenges. They, they, they do have people in this administration. The question is, how do they intend to use um, those contacts and, 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 and that line of communication? And what are they going to be pushing? So far, they haven't had much luck in terms of the issue with the immigration and the migration crisis, which wasn't before this kidnapping, the immediate issue that they were being confronted with. Thanks so much, Shatin. Uh, Bill, maybe can I ask you to speak a little bit about the connection between the political and the economic elites and, and the gangs and, and how to break that and perhaps uh, address a question that just came in about uh, opportunities for local governance or decentralized uh, the consultation to pursue, you know, improving day-to-day uh, -day security, but that is not necessarily through the central state. Sure, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll try that last, they're all tricky, but let me try. On the, on the gangs elite business, 
I think one tool that I haven't heard mentioned and maybe Jackie has uh, in discussing with folks in Washington is the Magnitsky Act. I'm not, maybe not pronouncing it correctly, but it's that act that's meant to get at people who could be linked in some ways to human rights violations, I guess it was after the Russian lawyer who was assassinated, but it's used now all over the place. And I, I'm also remembering back to 1990, 91, 91, 92, after Aristide was overthrown in the coup, um, what got some of the de facto people to the bargaining table to allow Aristide to return was visas being with new uh, visas being withdrawn, assets being frozen. All these people, or most of the people, have bank accounts in the U.S., houses in the U.S. or Canada, or Switzerland, or France. You name it. Kids going to school in these countries that gets their attention if they can't keep doing that. So that may be one way. I think you have a three level. You go after the backers of the gangs this way, you go after the leaders if you can arrest them and try them. And then you try to divert, as I said, the members to other life, you know, life, life, lives and futures. And this is not, not gonna be your, it's not a way to live or, or, or to evolve. So it, it's not easy, but I think I'd like to see more, hear more about uh, specific actions the US could take against the people who are really pulling the strings here with regard to the gangs and the violence. On helping the state, I wanna ask answer that question briefly too, because that's a real chicken and egg. You know, you always come up with this. You know, if the state's so weak that you just pour money in and it's wasted, but how's it ever going to be strong unless you pour money in? I think one approach that has worked in the past in Haiti and other places is to think about strengthening the state not only from the supply side by money or goodies, but from the demand side. And by that, I mean, this also enables you to work closely with civil society. So I'll give you two examples from Haiti quickly. One, was when I was with the UN mission there, we actually trained young Haitian recent law school graduates to represent detainees in Haitian prisons. And on any one day, probably including today, over 80% of the people in a Haitian prison have not been convicted of a crime. In most cases, they haven't even been charged yet with a crime. And the constitution says they're supposed to have a hearing within 48 hours and they decide to keep them or release them. And they well, many of them never have that hearing for weeks, weeks, if not months. So we got these lawyers to literally go in and just bug the judge every day. My client's in there. He should have had the hearing or she should have. When's the hearing? When's the hearing? The judge would. And eventually there'd be a hearing. And we found in those jurisdictions that the pretrial detention rate went down in half. And so in a way, you're helping the state perform its duties, what, what it should be doing already by putting demands on it from the citizens. And that can be empowering to the citizens. The other one briefly was training people to analyze budgets. And I'm talking about people way up on the mountaintops in the Mon um, and showing them that there, yeah, there is supposed to be a school and the, the teacher's supposed to be paid. Yes, there's a health clinic that's supposed to be drugs in the health clinic. They're never there. Why aren't they there? The money never got there. Why didn't the money get there? Corruption, stealing, whatever. But we, you empowered the people to make demands on their local authorities. And we saw it started to make a difference. So that's one way you help the state do what it should be doing anyway, uh, without wasting without wasting money or resources. And then maybe you can start building it in other ways. Um, the last point, sorry, remind me of the question that came in briefly that you'd like How to- How to strengthen the state from the local level and maybe- Well, that's, yeah, that and that's one. part of it. Yeah, and that's that, 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 that initiative is actually part of it. We, we had, these were really isolated rural communities uh, that we helped train to do this. We called it human rights budgeting. And so they would go to the local councilor, mayor, whatever it was in a commune. And so that would put pressure at a very local decentralized level. And in fact, one point I asked one of these local officials, well, I guess that was uncomfortable for you. He said, not really, because we never get the money here. It all gets stuck in Port-au-Prince. So I could then go to Port-au-Prince and say, look, I'm getting all this pressure, complaints, my life's miserable. You got to release some of the money anyway. So it actually, he saw, he saw it as a positive to get this pressure from below. And I think there are lots of, and there are lots of groups that Haiti, that's a, one of Haiti's great strengths is this vibrant civil society that just, as, as we've heard all morning, and we should keep hearing, needs to be listened to, needs to be consulted, needs to be involved, and, and they can work wonders if you just let, let them, like, and give them a little support, stay in the background and off they go. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, let me just say, because you mentioned me with the, the, the act, you know, I think, first of all, the act is there, there are tools available um, to the US government, including visas, but that requires investigations, right? That, that, mm -hmm. that requires you to put the resources on the ground 
um, to really look at the issues. I mean, for instance, we just take a, a situation with arms. Yesterday, I was talking to somebody and I said, I can understand why, um, for instance, the U.S. doesn't check vehicles or containers when they're leaving the United States and going into Haiti, and yet you put it the onus on Haiti to check these containers. And we already know what the situation is with the ports and the corruption and how things get through. And one of these they brought up to me says, well, you know, we only check like 1.6% of the containers that are coming mm. into the United States. But at the same time, you know, either way, you're going to end up having to be involved. So why not try to be involved on the front end as opposed to the back end? I mean, one of the things I think that has um, been disappointing is in terms of that, you know, while we fund that we provide funding to the Haitian National Police, um, and we now see the presence of the FBI in this particular hostage situation. The reality is, is that Haiti just hasn't had consistent, um, with the exception of the DEA, um, consistent presence of U.S. law enforcement in the country. In, in recent months, we've seen yet yeah, HSI has been there. Uh, maybe ATF may drop in, but they're they're coming and going. Um, you know, you don't even have an FBI attaché in the country anymore. That's that's consistent. So. Um, again, if you want to be able to sanction um, and, and address the issues with the arms and the gangs, you've got to put the resources in to do the investigations and to find out, you know, who are involved. And then those cases have to be prosecuted. I mean, we've written, you know, on my end here in the United States about the lack of prosecution by U.S. state attorneys, federal uh, attorneys on cases involving drug traffickers or drug cases out, out of Haiti. So when people don't see any of this is happening, they just continue to do business as usual. And there's just a sense of impunity because nothing's going to happen to me. And I think that's the message that has been that we have been sending um, inadvertently um, to, to, to Haiti, whether it's the kidnappers, the gangs, or the people who are funding them or bringing in the arms and ammunition. Just keep doing what you're doing because nothing's going to happen to me. Thanks so much, uh, Jacqueline. All right, we are really past our uh, deadline uh, of time, but I want to give uh, Ashish the opportunity to react to uh, this context in which the international community and the UN in particular has to act and, and how he sees those challenges. Thanks, Renata. Just very, very briefly, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. You know, I wanted to acknowledge and, and respond to Monique's, you know, very uh, helpful and I think uh, important comments, you know, about the perception of the UN. I agree completely, Monique. I mean, I think um, obviously, you know, going back to the Minusta days and the uh, cholera outbreak, you know, that's something that, you know, for myself as a, uh, a citizen of Nepal, you know, sadly, there was a strange intersection, uh, you know, between, uh, you know, my interest in, in, in Haiti and, you know, what happened with the sort of tragic, uh, outcomes, you know, following that, and the UN has been struggling ever since to you know, repair uh, its, its its reputation for sure, uh, and you know the the, the difficulties with the last uh, uh, Secretary General's term, um, you know, the, the trust fund and all of that. I think has been well covered elsewhere, but I think you know, in in practical terms, you know, what that means now is you know for sure, you know, anything uh, that has uh, uh, sort of the UN's involvement or you know even zooming out a bit more, uh, you know, the core group involvement, you know, is seen by certain parts of Haitian civil society is, you know, un untrustworthy. And I think that's important to try to understand and unpack. And, you know, the first step to that, you would think is you know, more consultation, more listening, more outreach. And so, again, I agree with you completely that, that, that you know, those are some, you know, minimum steps that would be helpful. Uh, you know, and, you know, that's why, you know, in terms of when we were discussing and formulating our own policies and recommendations in our report, uh, you know, one of the things we, we discussed was that, you know, it's important for the UN to also get this right, uh, partially to help Haitian actors on the ground and the country and then its needs, but also to keep in mind that, you know, by hopefully, uh, you know, pushing its energies and efforts in the right direction, it can also uh, repair its damage in, in that substantive way, you know, in addition to the outreach and in addition to, you know, listening to, uh, you know, civil society actors and, 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 and uh, you know, people on the ground. So just wanted to say I, I agree with that and thank you for, for, for those remarks. Thanks so much. Um, Ivan, do you want to bring us to a close and with our thanks to thank you so much, plus people that have been patient. Thank you. All, all our, our, our extremely patient, uh, you know, viewers and listeners. But above all, I'd like to thank uh, Leslie, Monique, Jacqueline, Bill, Ashish for all their contributions. I mean, it's come out so clearly to me listening to you that there is a problem with coordination within Haiti between Haiti and, and, and foreign governments, between Haitians living in Haiti and Haitians living outside Haiti. But there's also an issue about different parts of Haitian society, but above all, foreign governments 
picking the issue in Haiti they want to consider and not, and not thinking of the totality. And if this conversation and other conversations help understanding Haiti from the entirety of the problems it faces and not just one narrow strand, I think it will have helped. And so I really want to thank you all for bringing your different voices to this conversation. And, uh, and let's hope Haiti has a few months of relief from the stresses and strains of, of its recent times. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon.